investigate you to cover my lord. Episode four, season two of House of the Dragon was the best episode I have seen so far in the show. The whole reason I wanted to watch it in the first place is because of House Targaryen and their dragons. I love dragons. I love the lore behind them. I mean, this is no secret. So that's what drew me to this. And so this episode where we got to see a lot of dragon action was top tier for me. This isn't going to necessarily be a recap, but a breakdown of the fight and more so everything concerning the dragons in this episode, because that's what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in the people too. And since their relationship is heavily interested, integral with the dragons and it's interwoven with their existence. I'll be talking about that too. Keep in mind before I start that I did not read the books. And so if things are obvious to you because you're a book reader, please have the courtesy to recognize that people exist outside of the book fandom who are seeing the story for the first time and everything might not follow the books anyway. So here we go. But I was not told his savior was so comely. Your mother must have been very beautiful. Okay. So everything kind of begins here with Rhaenys heavily flirting with Alan, who rescued Corliss, her husband. And she not only tells her husband that Alan should be honored for what he did, but also to inform Corliss that Bela has called away Rhaenys to Dragonstone because the council in Rhaenyra's absence doesn't seem to be respecting Bela or Jaceres. I found this very awkward, but then my husband brought up something he heard someone else mention. And it's that Alan is probably the illegitimate son of Corliss, which would make a lot more sense why Rhaenys had that look and made that remark about his mother. To understand my lord husband knows that I will not told his savior was so comely. Your mother must have been very beautiful. Rhaenys. It's dude is like, woman, you were gonna get me in trouble. So that remark was either for it to mean that the mother must have been very beautiful enough to make her husband be unfaithful, or she must have been beautiful enough to make such a good looking guy like him. But I think it's the former since she somehow sees her husband in this guy and because of the remarks that she makes later. And Alan's head is shaved, so you can't see the color of his hair, but if his father bred a commoner woman, I know it sounds weird bred, but that's what happened. And the children were not Valerian or Targaryen or Valerian, you know, Valeria, then the children would have regular hair and not the silver hair that we see members of Valeria have, or at least the Valerians and the Targaryens. But then again, Corliss might not even know, but I have a feeling that he does. I thought that there relationship was close enough that he would, but the remarks that Rhaenys makes after saying that she knows who he is makes me believe that he hid it from his wife. Yes. You did not think to mention it. I did not think it relevant. I know who he is, Corliss. And then he hangs his head in shame. So yeah, Alicent is fiddling around with a stone figurine of a dragon. And when there's a knock at the door, she gets startled and the dragon drops on the floor, which seems to be heavy foreshadowing what's to come. In the next scene, it showcases Rainey's Bela, and Jace trying to reign in the council, who definitely is eager to send a dragon since Christian Cole's army is growing ever the larger. Nobody respects these people, and Jace is really trying hard here to live up to his role. Fastness of the crown lands. We could perhaps act if only we had a host of our own, or someone here to lead us. Mind your tongue, Sir Alfred. Does it speak falsely, my prince? This council is rudderless. Yeah, no respects are given until Corliss comes to aid his wife and the council immediately simmers down in his presence. Rhaenys says that Rhaenyra seeks to end this conflict and Kristen Cole, along with Alicent's brother, who clearly still doesn't like him, seek to go to Hall. So Aegon's mad at everybody in the room because to him it's like nothing is happening. And then he finds out that his younger brother Aemond, who he has been spamming with insults, has been plotting with Christian Cole behind his back and setting up a strategy to beat Rhaenyra with his badass chin looking like a shark fin. Look at that. Deuce face is a whole ass kitchen knife. I mean, Aegon is, he has every right to be mad. Sorry, it's his face. <laughs> he has every right to be mad, but he is very inexperienced and Aemon and everybody in the council can see it. And what makes matters so much worse, and this is how things start off, is when Aemon speaks in Valerian to address his brother, Aegon not only doesn't speak the tongue, but seems to have a hard time understanding it as well, which makes him pale in comparison to his obviously more experienced and competent brother. This whole scene was painful. The two of you have been plotting without my authority. Damn. 
the way it just ugh. embarrassing than a person who needs to have known the language of Ovalaria and is the king and can't speak it when his at moment at the moment the heir which is Aemon because his brother uh yeah his son's gone now so if he dies Aemon would be the heir and Aemon knows the language but you the king does not it's embarrassing I think even his grandfather no his father Viserys knew the language as well right like almost everybody else knows it except for him. Maybe because he was too busy getting high. Hmm. side eyes <laughs> everyone's giving to the king clearly demonstrates how uncomfortable they are but they also recognize that he probably isn't fit for a leadership role or strategic planning i don't know for certain if everyone here doesn't know the language i have a feeling laris does i want to showcase how uncomfortable this was for aegon so you can understand what drove him to what we're going to see later with the dance of the dragons because lord Luke Gaston vivilus Segiton Billy Vasni. Aemon's face. <laughs> no. Oh no. You see this? <laughs> that would be so embarrassing, especially since you're supposed to be so much better than my class. You bore me. So while the grown-ups are still speaking and planning, you know, everything for the war that they're supposed to be, hearing of Cole's victories and the constant mention of Aemon and Vagar being their best weapon, Aegon grows annoyed. And so he leaves the council room with the three councilmen and Laris and heads to his room to turn to alcohol. He had left that life behind for the most part, but I guess, you know, with his growing insecurity, and the recent loss of his son, it seems as though it's just been too much for him. His mother asks something about the books and he's like, I didn't burn them, I just had them removed, which is supposed to be important. And of course she can tell that something is wrong and she asks her son. And then he unleashes all of what's bothering him about the councilman not listening to him, Eamon not listening and them not respecting him. And then she gives him a quite harsh talk that he probably needed to hear. And it's one of the wisest things I've heard her say as a mother, she probably should have said it a lot sooner. And keep in mind, she's probably in a no nonsense attitude or mood right now because it's implied throughout this episode that she having drank that special tea that she probably aborted her infant by Christian Cole. What is it? They don't care what I think. Who? Hey, my counsel. Cole, Aemon, they pursue their campaign without seeking my aid or even my thoughts. What thoughts would you have? The look on his face says everything. And this is where the dominoes start to topple. I mean, they started toppling way before this, but Aegon's insecurities have been growing ever the more. And he is in a very vulnerable position, not just with the loss of his son, but also how he appears in front of his brother. Those men at your council table earned their seats. It's my hope that <laughs> once enthroned, you would honor the burden of your new duties, be silent and strive to learn from the more studied minds around you in the hope that you might be half the king your father was. Damn, I was cold. So after Alicent tells Aegon that he should do only what's expected of him, and that is absolutely nothing, Aegon feels a need to prove himself. And after becoming a cat and smashing a jar off the table, he decides that he needs to prove himself once and for all and heads out to battle to assist Cole and his army so he doesn't appear weak. I can't even blame the guy because as a king, it's understandable, especially if he's very inexperienced, to think that this is the right thing to do, especially after what has happened with his son and with not having wanted to be king. He was obviously very pained by what his mother said and felt he needed to prove himself. You are no son of mine. I did not ask for this. I've done everything you've asked me to. And I try so, I try so hard, but it will never be enough for you or father. Let me go, let me go, let me go. I have no wish to rule, no taste for duty, I'm not suited. You got no argument from me. Let me go, we'll find a ship and sail away, never to be found. 
Unfortunately, the culmination of all of this brings us to the dragon battle, where King Aegon completely disregards all the plans. Rhaenyra had come back and is now talking with her council. The man who she returned with is the son of the man whose head Kristen Cole took for his insolence because he refused to bend the knee to King Aegon. Anyway, Rhaenyra and her council know that they have to send out a dragon, and as Rhaenyra said, she now knows there's no chance of peace, she agrees and decides that she should go with her dragon. But Jace, her son, thinks that she's being foolish. He's in his rebellious stage. And possibly annoyed with her because of her constant inaction. To act, you need to send a dragon. There are those who have mistaken my caution for weakness. Let that be their undoing. I will go. My queen. Because of this, which Jace says, and everyone agrees, Rhaenyra being the worst one to send out because she is the queen, and if she is dead, all is lost, Rhaenys offers to go instead with her dragon. Maelys, the largest dragon they have, who is also very experienced in battle. We will soon see that experience in action. Now we see Rhaenys and Aegon respectively preparing themselves for battle on each other's dragons. You see Maelys walking to meet her rider. It's as if she already knows what's coming and probably sense that she's about to go into battle. Since she's no stranger to battle, it makes sense that in this moment, Maylise is completely aware of the situation based on the tension that Rhaenys is feeling. Maylise understands what's being asked of her. I never told you because I was unsure that I believed it myself. The Targaryen who sits the Iron Throne is not just- It was so, so sweet seeing Sunfire greet Aegon here. And you can tell the connection they both have. However, the first thing that I notice is how small Sunfire is. And the poor puppy seems to have such a really good natured disposition, which only emphasizes Aegon's inexperience. Honestly, I think because of Otto Hightower forcing Aegon into this role, he unknowingly created a monster out of this kid. You know, reminiscent of the Disney kids who grow up and then become menaces to society. Yes, you are. <laughs> You can almost see the innocent little child that Aegon was before he grew up and then experienced what he did and did those freaking heinous things. And yes, now that he's an adult, he's accountable for his actions, but his family forced him into this. They are partly responsible. Someone said that any feeling that the rider connected to their dragon is feeling the dragon would feel as well. So it's possible that flying into battle, Sunfire might feel the effects of being drunk. Needless to say, both Aegon and Sunfire are very inexperienced when it comes comes to battle, especially against another dragon with experience. And just to draw back the parallel here, you hear Rin is saying to Maylise that they're off to battle. You can see how calm, collected, and mature this old red female is in comparison to Sunfire. Rhaenys and her dragon fly out immediately and accost Kristen Cole and his army. Here's when the troops announce that they've seen a dragon, and it's Maylis and her rider, Rhaenys, that they've spotted. Now, smartly, Kristen Cole has planned all of this and signals Aemond to fly into the fray and neutralize the dragon threat. <laughs> This should be easy for him and his Godzilla-like titan dragon Vagar. However, what no one saw coming was King Aegon blasting in on his dragon and interrupting the plan. And you can see how visibly angry Aemond is and he tells his dragon to wait. He's like, God damn it, you freaking... Like, when he gets angry, you can see it on his face. I love his facial expressions. He, he does not miss with those. <laughs> Ombas, Vega, see in the war. Now I took this to mean that Vagar should wait because when she's in the thick of battle, she seems unable to distinguish who her enemies are. However, we have to remember that dragons are quite intelligent and have minds of their own. I think Aemon hung back and cursed his brother because he knew that his brother was inexperienced with his dragon Sunfire. Aemon knew full well that King Aegon was gonna get his ass handed to him going up against an experienced dragon and one much bigger than his. So Aemon just is like, all right, fine. You know what, let's just wait. And he lies in wait and watches what happens while Titan Vagar lays plops down on what are supposed to be some very medium-sized trees but look like ferns. 
I don't know if they meant for that to happen, but the scaling is off here because these types of ferns wouldn't grow as large as they appear next to a dragon whose head is as big as a semi. Anyway, the big dragon also has to consume a lot of energy because she is quite large. And I can only imagine it would take a tremendous amount of energy expenditure to not only lift herself off the ground, but also carry herself in the air and remain airborne. So if she's going to do any attacking, it needs to be worthwhile. Now around this time, I think that Sunfire and Melee's have made eye contact. It doesn't seem so, but dragons are flying creatures. They have binocular vision. So their vision is going to be way better, especially in the daytime. Sunfire knows what's expected of him, but they're mismatched not only in experience, but also the sheer size of the other dragon. Melee is probably sees no threat and continues with the task at hand, which is obliterating as much of Cole's army as possible. And Cole, never one to waste a bad opportunity, tells his men that the king is joining them and tries to embolden them. Easy to say when they're King is on a dragon himself, but Cole is worried since Eamon has not shown up. Where are you, Eamon? Maybe at my mother's snatch where you've been. Yeah, now that Sunfire and King Aegon are a lot closer, Melee's is given the command to attack. That does, As we can see here, Melee's is only given the command to attack. Using Sunfire's own fire breath as visual cover, Melee's dives underneath a blind spot that Sunfire would not see as an opening because he does not have any experience in battle and neither does his rider. We saw something similar in the attack from Vagar, a way more experienced dragon, and Arax, which had no experience. So here's a breakdown. As Melee's attacks from underneath, notice what she does first. Dragons do seem to do this with each other in battle and the bigger one will usually grab the leg of the smaller one as we see her do here. Notice she's grabbing onto his left hind leg in order to keep it anchored in place so that the bigger dragon can perform a closer melee attack using her claws, teeth, and fire to inflict damage. Ouch. The attack put me in mind of the brutal fight with Godzilla tearing Kong's ass up in Godzilla vs. Kong 2021. <laughs> Except in this scene, Godzilla was trying his best to torture the poor guy. You could see it in his face. Why the frick am I here? I think Melee's doing this is also very strategic on her part because she seems to be specifically aiming for this big chest area of this dragon. And as we see her inflicting damage, black liquid pours out. And I noted this, it's not bright red blood as we usually see when the dragons are injured. It's a black oily looking liquid, which makes me believe that it might be the liquid that the dragons use to ignite their fire, which would handicap this dragon from being able to use fire, which could hurt Melee's rider or blind her. <laughs> Now we know that dragon blood is so hot that it could boil people, but again, notice when it is falling down on the men, it is black liquid, not red. Could this be a mistake in editing? Sure, but knowing the show, I don't think that was a mistake, especially since every other dragon injury we have seen from House of the Dragon, like the one I just showed from Vagar's attack on Arax, shows bright red blood. It is very obvious that it is blood that we're seeing. We see the same thing when Rhaegal is killed in Game of the Thrones. Bright red blood is spewing out of the dragon. It is very clearly red. When Rhaegal is pierced in the neck, we see bright red blood being spewed from his mouth. And the same goes for when the Night King had killed Viserion. Even though it is shot darker, in the close-up areas, you can see that the blood is very clearly red. It when Viserion dives into the water after dying slowly from blood loss, you can see the trail of blood that is placed in the water is also red tinged, despite how dark the scene is. So I found it interesting that they very specifically showed up close that the liquid that was coming out of this little dragon was unmistakably black or very dark. 
more dark than just regular red blood, unless this dragon has black blood for some reason unknown to us. It's also important to note that when dragons fight each other, they're fighting each other, not the humans. I found it particularly interesting because without a rider, the dragons might not have any direction, but this tracks since the dragons in Game of Thrones universe seem to function as extensions of their riders anyway. Anybody else feel horribly bad for Sunfire? Someone on Reddit said that this is akin to taking your beautiful Labrador puppy and placing them in a dogfight. It's even more heartbreaking is when Sunfire feels pain for the first time, when Melee's claws cut through him, you can see his eyes get really big. Look at, look how big the poor baby's eyes are. Cause he's feeling that pain. He's like, oh my shit. So yeah, I did notice this, and it does seem as though Melee's instantly goes for the chest. Oh my god, poor thing. This is so hard to watch. And she was possibly attempting to gut the smaller dragon. Oh my god, he's in so much pain. Whew. Or she's either going for the heart, but I think that based on what we see her aim for and the liquid that spilled out that she was going for the fuel or oil sack or whatever the hell this black liquid is that we see flying out. And we can see that his leg is also badly damaged for Sunfire. Another thing to note is, is that even though Sunfire is so badly damaged and is falling, he writes himself just before he hits the floor, and I think he did this as a means to protect Aegon. But the battle doesn't stop there, because now you can tell from him flying erratically and his leg being limp that he is badly injured. His leg is badly injured, and Sunfire is in more pain than he's ever experienced in his entire life. He's barely started his life, but I'm sure he didn't know what the concept of battle is, because he's never felt it, and neither has Aegon. So there was no possible way to prepare this poor dragon. Notice how injured and pain-stricken he is is while still trying to carry his rider away from the danger. Unfortunately, because of Melee's experience, danger is always around the corner, and she always knows to keep herself behind her target. <laughs> This is very heartbreaking to watch because at this point in time, poor Sunfire doesn't even look like he's trying to fight back, like he bites, but he looks as though he's a little puppy pleading and trying to submit to a larger dog. He's in tremendous pain and he doesn't know how to fight back this bigger thing. He doesn't have the experience and he doesn't have the personality for it. So as Melee's comes up behind and assaults him, the only thing that the poor dragon can do is cry out and plea that she stop and try to submit. He had ample time to try and bite at her here and yet he doesn't because it looks like he doesn't want to piss her off but he's also in tremendous pain but the natural thing that most animals would do is bite at the bigger animal and he looks like he wants to but then he doesn't possibly because he's trying to cry and whimper to tell her to stop that he doesn't mean any harm but the poor baby doesn't realize that this is battle and his pleas and cries for mercy are not going to be enough to make this larger dragon stop. By now, the king realizes that he's definitely outmatched. He's scared, but one thing I'll give Aegon is that he's brave, because I'm pretty sure he was scared going into battle, but he didn't properly know who he was going up against. Melee shows no mercy as she drives her fangs into the wing of the younger dragon, purposely to maim him and bring him down from the sky. <laughs> Bro, the slow motion and the haunting lack of music when Vagar starts to appear, that is so well shot because it, it lets you know the sheer size of the animal before it even appears on screen. And then everyone's like, whose dragon is this? And it's very clear you can see the scale of how large this dragon is. And all I'm wondering is, how the hell is Aemond gonna save the king if he is locked in battle with Maelise? And I have a bad feeling. You can see how much effort it takes just for Vagar to fly. And I think Cole is realizing that he doesn't have control of the situation because the king is currently engaged with Rhaenys with her dragon. And if Aegon is heading over there, how is he going to help the king if the king is at the moment locked in with the other dragon? This is also the dragon that killed the younger dragon and Rhaenyra's son. You can see Aemond focused and I don't think he cares whether or not Aegon is locked in. But Cole and everyone there is hoping that he will fix the problem 
And of course, two dragons against one, which let's be honest, this is not a match. It's definitely skewed in favor of the largest dragon. He doesn't have to catch you necessarily, and you can do as much damage as possible, but he just needs to hit you once. So we see in the background, it's easy to miss it, but when we slow it down, it's very clear that Sunfire on the right over there is trying to turn towards Maylise so his claws are facing her so he can try to fight, but he's also trying to get away from her. Look at his movements. They're injured, but but they're also submissive. This dragon through his body language is pleading for this dragon to stop. He doesn't understand what is happening. And Maylise is just relentless, going in on him like a pit bull would do to a small puppy. Now Rainy sees that Vagar has entered the fray. And I already knew that by the way Rainy's looked, she knew she was gonna die. She went in this battle completely under the notion that she was not gonna come back from it, but she was gonna do as much damage as possible. She could just kill as much of them as possible. She would have done her job. And this is when Sunfire decides to finally fight back because he realizes there's no other choice and he pulls one of Melee's his horns off of her body, which hurts. And even though Melee's cries out in pain, she still does not let go. She bites in even harder because how dare this little pissant fight back. Very heartbreaking because you could see the joy on Aegon's face because he's like my brother is coming he's coming to help me except he realizes to his chagrin that he's not coming to help him and his dragon is being poised to fire it's a very haunting realization when his brother stops in midair and chooses not to come any further which I'm sure people on the ground can see as well Poor, poor Sunfire. The poor baby thought he was going out for a walk in the park with his pops, and this is the nightmare he is living now. This is, this is his reality. This is his life. This is what he's working with. This is it. Can you imagine? There is no training involved. I don't even think they trained this poor young dragon on being able to fight. He just woke up and was happy because his master was going to take him out on a, on, a, on a fly. He's just like, yes, we're going to fly. And he's probably feeling his master with this drunken courage like, we're going to have an adventure today. And poor Sunfire's like, really? Oh, daddy, I'd love to have an adventure. And then this is the adventure. <laughs> Yeah, nothing to dismantle an army than seeing their king fall brutally from out of the sky. Had Otto Hightower still be the hand of the king, as calculating as he was and how he kind of caused all of this, he would have avoided all of this. He would have tried his best to avoid all of this, but he didn't keep a handle on this kid early enough. He just thought that everyone's the same and they'll just listen. Now here we are. You can see Sunfire pathetically trying to flap his wings, which are on fire. The bigger a dragon is, is the hotter I believe its fire is. So fire from Maylise would have been really bad, but fire from Vagar is worse. And I'm sure it's painful to the human too, but the dragon would have protected him. And you could see that this poor dragon is trying to right itself. I think to preserve its life, but also to, to preserve his rider's life. The dragon doesn't want to fall on his back because he wants to protect his rider. And I like how they showcase Sunfire's face here because they want us to feel what he's feeling. They want us to see his look of total terror, pain, and confusion at what is happening to him. And all while still wanting the best for his rider. <laughs> So from what we can see here, Sunfra is trying his best to right himself. And I think right at the last moment, the dragon is able to land on his chest in an attempt to save Aegon. I really believe that's what that was. Meanwhile, Melee's tries to collect herself, gain some distance from the bigger dragon to go in for another attack. Rhaenys realizes that she's not walking away or like flying away from this battle. And so when she realizes what she's up against, that big Godzilla creature back there, you see the look of resolve on her face. This is a warrior who knows that they are going to die in battle. 
and they're going to try their best to take down whoever they can before they do. She also, I'm sure, conveys this to Meili's as well. And she says attack. And Meili's knows what this means. Meili's knows that she's all in. And Meili's is a good warrior. You know that this woman means business because she hooks herself onto the saddle so she cannot fall off. Come what may, she is dying with her dragon. She knows that both of them are going to die. And this reminds me of the scene that was very heartbreaking from this show called Farscape that my husband made me watch. It's an amazing show where the badass guy brings Talon into battle and the both of them die together. In this show, the ships like the mothership Moya have minds of their own. And so Talon, who was born from her, is basically like a dragon. He has a mind of his own. And this guy, this character who was um, aboard him has become bonded to him. And so to save their friends and to go up against the villains, they sacrifice themselves. Talon. Starburst. Yes, Moya. I see it. I see it. This just brought that back in mind because there was no hesitation on Talon's part. It was ride or die with his rider. And that's what's happening with Rainey's here. So Rainey's and Melee's try to gain the advantage by going underneath. And as she ascends, Eamon sees her and also sees that his brother has fallen. But he must take care of something first. <laughs> So you see the size difference between these guys, right? You see, like, imagine putting your little Prius, okay, I wouldn't call her a Prius, but like a pickup truck. Let's say a, doesn't have to be the biggest pickup truck, but let's say an F-150. And then you see a tractor trailer heading in your direction at full speed ahead while you're also heading at it full speed ahead. Who do you think is, who do you think survived? Who do you think's walking away from that accident? I mean... I don't even think that's a fair assessment. Like I, I would rather say like a pickup truck versus a tank. That That's what this would be. Or a car, a sedan versus a tank. Notice what Melis does here. She immediately positions herself underneath Vagar, right before Vagar reaches her. This dragon is smart. She's clearly experienced. I think that Rainey's is also giving her commands, but she's also, I think most of the tactical advances is the dragon doing it, especially if the dragon has experience. The rider directs the dragon to wherever she needs the dragon to attack. However, if the dragon's a good enough fighter, the dragon will do what it does normally. So Melis positions herself underneath this much larger dragon and she knows that the momentum of Vagar is so much and the dragon is so slow moving that she wouldn't be able to maneuver very easily as Melise changes at the last moment and flips underneath her most likely to get at the soft underbelly or the chest similar to what she did with Sunfire. But Vagar is also experienced and as you see, Melee's positioning her claws to hurt Vagar. Vagar also is positioning her feet to grab at Melee's, which she does effortlessly before Melee's can get out of there, crushing her leg instantly when she grabs it and pulling Melee's along, making it very hard for Melee's to flap her wings because of the momentum of being dragged. Immediately, Vagar wastes no time. You can tell this dragon, who is much older and much larger and more experienced, immediately unleashes her fire right at the rider. You can see it here. Vagar aims for the rider. It's specifically on the top of the dragon. Very good attention to detail when you slow down the scene because Melis realizes what's happening and she tries to position herself in such a way to protect her rider. See how she curls herself and pulls herself inward to risk burning her soft underbelly in order to protect Rhaenys. The two dragons flap in unison and you can see that Melis even anchored her Herself onto this dragon to flip over and behind the much larger dragon. Unlike Sunfire though, who has a more submissive approach, Melis goes on the attack immediately, her foot becomes dislodged and she immediately uses her claws 
to try and scratch at the same area she did with Sunfire to disable the other dragon's firepower. However, Vagar is such a large dragon that there is more meat that Melees would need to get through to get to this. Clearly, this is a very soft spot for the dragons when it comes to other dragons, because Vagar is hit with a tremendous amount of pain and her head whips back. Melees also uses this opportunity to blow forth her own fire, possibly trying to aim at the fuel or that viscous liquid that was inside the sack of Sunfire that I think all these dragons have. And I don't know how this woman's hair isn't singed off. Do Targaryens have hotter than normal blood or are they more or less susceptible to fire? I know that Daenerys is the unburnt, but do Targaryens who work with dragons have more of a tolerance? against fire? I have no idea, but based on what we saw with both these Targaryens getting fire blown right at them, they seem to be fine. Like, look at this. So this is what they call the Dance of the Dragons. When two dragons are locked together, both blowing fire, it looks like an aerial dance in the sky. The dance of the dragons. Very poetic, but also very haunting. And Maelys is fighting her ass off. This dragon clearly has experience for her to hold her own and not get immediately killed by a much larger and more experienced dragon like Vagar. Did you see that kind of suplex move that Melees did? She kept locked in with Vagar to try and drive her to the ground. And the flipping that she was doing was probably to make Vagar off balance. And Vagar's face looks like she didn't realize how close to the ground she was because the way she hit the ground where she's like, oh shit. She clearly wasn't prepared for that because she didn't realize how close to the ground she was. She's not as agile. And doing those aerial moves, Melees is a smaller and lighter dragon. She can handle all of that. Vagar cannot. Melees also probably used her firepower to distract Vagar and to kind of blind her as well. So the dragon didn't realize which way was up until it was too late and came crashing down with all of her momentum. While Melees flies away and is like, uh-huh, that's what you get, sucker. You look stupid, don't you? And she immediately takes off to go and collect herself while Vagar is eating dirt. This is a very interesting scene that we see, the sheer size of this dragon as these people are running for their lives. Like a scene from out of Jurassic Park, we see this very large creature and its feet and these poor men unable to get out of there fast enough before the dragon just squishes them. I mean, this is a scary sight and there is nothing you can do. Anyway, Vagar wastes no time and it is surprising how such a large dragon manages to get into the air very shortly after clapping the ground like this. The way that Rhaenys and Maelys exchange their looks here, I think Maelys realizes what Rhaenys is saying. They're speaking to each other here. Maelys is saying to the end and Rhaenys is saying to the end. See, I don't think Maelys is afraid of dying. I mean, I'm sure she is. She's an animal. No animal wants to die. I'm sure Maelys doesn't want Rhaenys to die. I don't know if Maelys has any hatchlings, but I imagine that dragons would have some level of responsibility to their offspring and their pack. They seem to be very social creatures, hence how they were able to be bonded with humans. And so the two exchange their looks and it's a very touching and sad moment. I mean, this was so well shot. We can even see the expression on Melis's face. She is sad and wearing the same expression that Rhaenys is wearing, which is letting us, the audience, know that they both know by now they're going to die. And the next attack might be their last. <laughs> so interesting is how such a large animal can be so silent with its wings. In both cases, when Vagar ever attacks something, when we saw her attack something, you could not hear her coming. It's creepy. It puts me in mind of the barn owl. And I don't know if this is specific to Vagar or to just a dragon that's experienced. Her wings are also very large, but being able to fly this silently puts me in mind of predators who have adapted to hunting smaller prey. <laughs> Good girl. I know we trapped her. Oh, she's. 
Mal. And now, Shh. it's Kenza's turn. Uh, uh, uh. something to the whole silent flyer angle here with Vagar being as large as she is and experienced and somehow managing to sneak up on dragons. So the one mistake that Melee's and Rainey's here made is not flying high enough and going into an area where they could not see. If you know this is a dragon that could be hiding anywhere and you've not seen her, do not put yourself in a position or an area that is at a disadvantage visually, where something could be lurking but you can't see them. Of course, Vagar is more experienced and we see her head peeking out from below as she quickly goes into the offense and grabs Melis by the neck, making it impossible for the smaller dragon to scratch at her, blow fire, or do anything to attack Vagar. Completely caught off guard, Melis has already lost this battle with this much larger dragon's mouth around her neck. Vagar crunches one last time, crushing the dragon's mouth. Now we also see the same black liquid here. I'm sure some of this is blood, and I don't know if it's just mixed in with that liquid from Melis's fire fuel. If this is the fire fuel thing, then this is more heartbreaking because it basically means that Melis was about to blow fire or at least was trying to blow fire and the liquid was probably making its way up the pipe but could not escape and escaped through the wounds here where Vagar bit into. So Melis was probably trying to blow fire as a last ditch effort to defend herself and because now her neck is cut, just like if you had a hole poked through your windpipe or your neck, you couldn't breathe out through your mouth or your nose, it would just kind of escape through there. That's why when people are stung and their airways close, they have somebody poke a hole in their neck so they can breathe. Except now this dragon is probably drowning in her own blood and this flammable liquid if this is in fact what this is. So with no ability to breathe fire and her suffocating in the jaws of this dragon, not only is she drowning in her own liquid, she is suffocating. And I think that Vagar isn't even clamping down her neck that tightly. I think Vagar is just making her asphyxiate, which is a worse death to be honest. I mean, when I say asphyxiate, I mean drowning, drowning in her liquids rather than just having her oxygen or whatever cut off. Another thing that people might have missed, right before Melee's dies, you can see her eyes focus on Rainey's right there. See the eye change? She is dying and her pupil, look very carefully, it shifts to the right so she can look directly at her rider. And she is looking at her rider the entire time. See the eyes? I think she's looking right at Rainey's as she's meeting her demise. As if to say, I'm sorry, or that's just the one last look that she's giving her right before the light leaves her eyes. That is the last thing that Rainey sees before the life leaves this poor dragon's eyes. You can even terrifyingly see the brightness just dull at the moment that Melis dies and her inner lid closes and then her eyes close slowly. The last thing that this dragon saw was her rider. And maybe that was the one piece that she was trying to gather from all of this. Because if you were dying, you would want as you're dying for you to look at the one thing that you love. And that is Rainey's. And Rainey's in turn, looked at her dragon is a way to be with her in her last moments. And you could see Rainey's here, let go and just embrace her death because she knew she was gonna die. She knew. And as the both of them are fa falling, Ryder and Dragon together, there's an explosion, I'm sure, because the dragon's gland or organ or whatever it is holds the fuel. When those things or whatever it interacts with in their body, you touch to make the, the, the flammable gas that they spew out ignites with the air and that's why we get what we get there. We've seen the same thing too with Viserion as he is blowing fire and even as he stops blowing the fire or whatever is going on back there ignites until all that fuel has leaked out of him until it's just blood. Rhaegal, however, I don't think it hit him where it was supposed to and it was just blood that was coming out. He wasn't blowing any fire and so we just saw blood with him. Of course, all of this is just speculation. In both cases, Viserion and Rhaegal hit the water so we didn't get to see them pop into flame. 
as we saw here with Maylise falling to the ground and even the king's dragon falling to the ground as well. You'll notice that when dragons hit the ground, whether they're breathing fire or not, there is an explosion, but they also had open wounds or that flammable liquid was somewhere exposed with their blood or the air, or maybe those glands popped together. Either way, when those two liquids ignite into gas, they seem to have that effect, which is to burst into flame upon violent contact. Whether it be the dragons spewing them together via the twin hoses in their mouths, as you can see here on Drogon, here and here, or they make contact with each other in a violent collision, such as smashing to the ground. Anyway, Vagar must feel pretty pleased with herself seeing the aftermath of the dead Melis and Rhaenys on the ground. You can also see just how hot dragon fire is as people literally became ash in their arms. A huge swath of the army, as a matter of fact, had become ash. That's what he gets. Kings, follow me, must find him. That part was very sad, but you know, it's very humbling for Cole, which is probably a good thing because I don't think he thoroughly understood exactly what dragons were capable of until he saw it happen. And now he's probably wondering, holy shit. Yeah, this um probably wasn't the best idea. I mean, I thought I knew what was gonna happen, but uh, now that I'm actually seeing it with my eyes, turns out it's probably a better idea to think carefully about what you do and the ramifications of it before you do it. But it's not his strong suit. Anyway, when Cole makes it to the location of the king you can see the explosion of the dragon's liquids caused everything in the surrounding area to catch a flame and we see Aemon closing in towards his brother with a broken sunfire on the ground. The dragon is still alive. You can hear the sunfire breathing and Aemon only stops when he's about to kill Aegon, which is what it looks like. We see him and we know that's what he's gonna do because as Cole looks, Aemon's sword is unsheathed and he looks as though he's gonna kill him, but I do think the motion here, don't know why his sword was out in the first place, but he does look as though he was about to sheathe his sword before Cole stepped in and said something. But Cole wasn't sure what was going to transpire had he not intervened. Amen. Yeah, I don't think Eamon was going to kill him. Upon reflection, it doesn't seem as though Eamon was planning on killing his brother. Look at the position he had the sword. It looks as though he was getting ready to sheathe him. Had he not been ready to sheathe his sword, he would have been much closer to his brother and he wouldn't have held it out like this before approaching his brother. As you can see here after he sheathes the sword and where Eamon is in comparison to his brother. When Cole asks where his grace is, Eamon points into the distance and that's when we see where Sunfire is curled around Aegon. Sunfire Sunfire's all burnt up. You can see that Sunfire is still breathing laboriously while Aegon is curled under his tail and wing. This is very heartbreaking to watch because it seems as though Sunfire to the very end tried to protect his rider and shielded him from danger. His grace probably fell off the dragon at the last moment and Sunfire possibly might have crawled towards Aegon and positioned himself around his rider to protect him. That is usually a stance that dragons will take when protecting their eggs or their babies, which is very telling and very heartbreaking. I mean, somebody could have put the poor dragon out of his misery. I mean, but you know, let's just leave the dragon there suffering, but whatever. Also, with Sunfire still being alive, they might draw a parallel to Aegon being alive. But if he is alive, which we can't tell from here, he's probably so badly injured that he's not himself. We don't know. But if he was truly dead, we would have seen a close up of him being dead. They purposely left it up in the air. I also think that this is the reason why, and I might be wrong, Sunfire is shielding him because he knows that his rider is still alive and he wants to protect him to his last breath. Sunfire's eyes are closed, but he is very much super injured. You can see the violent injuries. Now you can see a little flesh there with all the scratches. 
and the really bad burns from the much larger Vagar. And the once beautiful golden little innocent dragon is now a very horrific casualty of this war. And him being alive actually is more horrific than if he had died. Because now it showcases suffering, unnecessary suffering. And once again, you can see remnants of that black liquid on his tail. It is not red, it is black. You can tell the difference between that and the red flesh in his chest. And that's the breakdown of the dragon fight. What I'm more interested in is how Damon would fight against Aemon with Caraxes. By the way, just so you guys know, I know there were some people who were saying Caraxes was female, and they said this when I pointed out like some little anime concept renditions of what Caraxes would look like. He were an anime character, and a lot of you were like, oh, sorry to tell you, Caraxes is actually female, not a boy, so. And for people wondering what I'm talking about right here, this is not the only person who was pointing out that Caraxes or Caraxes is female. Where? Caraxes. Call the Bloodworm was a dragon ridden at first by Prince Aemon Targaryen and later by Prince Daemon Targaryen. Caraxes was huge, was red, huge, and lean. <laughs> really? Red, huge, and lean? Okay, whatever. In battle, he, he, he <laughs> was formidable, fearsome, and experienced. By the end of his life, Caraxes was considered an old and cunning dragon. It is unknown when Caraxes hatched from his egg, but by 7-2 AC, he was a young dragon of writable size. In another fandom, it says that Caraxes, also known as the Blood Worm, was a male dragon who lived during the height of the Targaryen rule in Westeros. Now, people on Reddit are saying that, that the dragons can change genders when necessary. I know there's some reptiles that do that. There's quite a few animals, specifically fish and some amphibians, which allows them to be one sex during one part of their life and change into another during the other. At some points, it depends on whether or not there is availability of the opposite sex. Jurassic Park even mentioned this in the first movie with the scene with Alan Grant explaining the amphibian DNA. The dinosaurs are breeding. We've never said on the dinosaurs were girls. Amphibian DNA on a tour. Film said they used frog DNA to fill in the gene sequence gaps. They mutated the dinosaur genetic code and blended it with that of frogs. Some West African frogs have been known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single sex environment. Malcolm was right. Life found a way. So while it's possible that Caraxes could change his sex at some point, nothing I have seen indicates otherwise that he has changed into a female or laid eggs. I could be wrong, like I said, I didn't read the books, but even just looking on the internet based on the little bit of evidence that we have and what fans are saying, everything points to him being male. One person said two years ago, House of the Dragon sound designer, now I don't know, you have to fact check this, but this person said that the sound designer said Caraxes is always hitting on the lady dragons and that he tries to sing a new lovesick rap song that he wrote for Serax episode two. Another person said, I remember reading in the book that during a time in which Damon and Rhaenyra spent a lot of time with each other, Serax had laid a lot of eggs. So I guess that's implied. Would have to look for the exact passage though. The other person said, I thought I had read this too. I found it weird freaky that the dragons would have offspring the way their riders did. Like when the rider is hurt, the dragon feels it. They're around each other all the time. So I assume Serax and Caraxes are aware their riders are involved. And I think there have been cases of other mated riders having their dragons also mate with each other. People are also saying that Parthenogenesis where females are able to reproduce by themselves in the absence of males happens as well, which would make sense so that the species would continue. But notice that throughout the screen time and the life of Drogon and his brothers, none of them laid any eggs and they all spent a lot of time together. Had they been female, I believe at least one of them would have been able to lay eggs, either from mating with the others if they're the only ones in existence. I don't think reptiles have the same threshold and taboo of ancestral relationships, especially given that Targaryens are known for it. But yet the dragons are definitely well within mature age of breeding and we got no eggs from any of these dragons which implies that possibly they are all male. And in species, monogamous species like clownfish, there are times when males can change to females, but apparently this is the most infrequent change. More so, you'll have females turning into males when necessary, but it's much harder or way more rare for a male species or a male counterpart to change into a female. And this method of sex change only appears apparently in 55 known species. So anyway, fun fact, let's not say things are facts unless we have the evidence to back it up because I would like to be proven wrong. I'd like to know this for sure, but until we know, most of the fandom is saying that Caraxes is in fact a male. Anyway, this episode was badass. I loved it. I watched it over several times. 
Let's see what we have in store. And the one I feel most bad for are the kids and these innocent dragons who are being used as weapons of destruction. Still want to see Caraxes in action though.